So today we're going to take a look at section 1.10, which is radical expressions. Um, we've talked about radicals briefly, like it was in the first section of material I think that we did, um, and we're going to explore them a little more deeply today. So I want you to recall that the square root of 25 is equal to 5, and that's great. When it's a perfect square, we just take the square root, no big deal. The square root of 50 doesn't have a perfect square root, right? So we can get an approximation for it in our calculator, of course. I mean, like, that's one way to sort of work with it. Uh, we talked about early on, I think it's first section of material, second section of material, looking for numbers on either side of it that are perfect square roots to try to give a ballpark idea of how close we would be. Um, we're going to look at how to simplify square root of 50, though, um, in a perfect way today, okay? So keeping it exact as opposed to an approximation. Everything we've done so far has been approximation. So the answer to this question is actually that it's an irrational number. <clears throat> and the irrational number is actually 5 square root 2. And we're going to go further into this, but the question would be then, but why and how? So we're going to look at square root of 50 as our first value. Um, as we're looking at our radicals, um, these first couple are just numbers, and then we're going to involve variables in the process. We're going to be factoring. Um, there's several ways to factor. I'm going to stick, I think, mostly with factor trees. Um, you've probably seen them before. Um, so 50 will divide by, at the very least, 2, if you didn't know anything else. You might look at it and think, oh, it divides by either 10 or by 5 as a get-go. And I think that's a good place for us to start because it does have a multiple of 10 in it. So it's 10 times uh, 5 is 50, and then we would break our 10 down into 5 times 2. Everybody good so far? Okay, we're just breaking it down into its simplest factor pieces. And what we're looking for if we're doing square roots is we're looking for factors that repeat. So there's a 5 here that repeats. And if there's two factors of 5 underneath a square root, Think about what would happen if I multiplied these together. 5 times 5 is 25. And what's the square root of 25? That's 5. So when I have two values that are paired up together underneath the radical, I can bring them outside of the radical. So the pair of 5s comes out one time. And the 2 that doesn't have a pair remains underneath the radical. So that's the previous slide that we looked at, the why. Why does that happen? It happens because of factoring. So we can do the same thing with 48. So somebody tell me something that 48 factors by. Like what's a division factor for? 4 and 12, sure. Um, and we keep going until they're primes. So 4 will become 2 and 2. How about 12? 4 and 3. Um, whoops, 3. And then the 4 is actually, I'm running out of space for this. Let me shift it over. 4 is actually another 2 and 2, right? Okay. So we're looking for any pairs that we have that go together. So there's a pair of 2s right here, right? Those are a pair. There's a pair of 2s right here as well. So each of these 2s in a pair comes out one time. So I've got a 2 coming out from here and a 2 coming out from here. That means I have a 4 on the outside and then the 3 that's underneath will still be underneath the radical. Because it's not a pair. So the nice thing is, this doesn't always happen when we move into algebra kind of expressions, but the algebra expressions work the same way. So we deal with the coefficient in much the same way we just did. So the 45 will break down into what? 9 and 5 will work, and 9 is 3 and 3. So I have a pair of 3s, right? So in terms of the coefficient part of this, the 3 will come out, and the 5 will stay underneath. In terms of the x to the fourth, that means there's four x's. Now, I'm not going to draw this every single time, but for, for a couple of these anyway, I will. I have four x's, and I'm looking for groups of 2. Well, that's two groups of 2. So just like my two groups of two, I'm sorry, there's two groups of x, just like my two groups of two up here before, I bring each of these individual groups out one time 
So that means I've got an x now on the outside and another x, so I have an x squared. Because there are two groups of two x's. So I didn't need the extended piece there. Four. I've got 12. We dealt with 12 already before. When we did 12 before, we broke it down into 4 and 3, and then the 4 into 2 and 2, and we found a pair of 2s, right? So the 2 will come out, and the 3 will stay under. But now I have three Ys. I'm grouping them in 2s. So what's going to happen? Yeah, one will be on the outside, because there's a group of 2. And then there's another one that's not in a group of two, and it will stay underneath the radical. So one of the twos moves out with the two, the no, sorry, one of the y's moves out with the two, and one of the y's stays underneath the radical with the three. Okay, so we've been using these radicals, um, and um, another way that are sometimes called as roots You've heard of them called square roots specifically for the ones that we've done so far. Um, but radical notation is sort of what we're going to look at on our next slide. Um, so in radical notation, there's actually three pieces to a radical. So the general radical looks like this. It is the nth root or the nth radical of A. This N over here is called the index. And if there's nothing there, which there hasn't been in any of the ones we've done so far, it's an understood two. Did I go off screen? Mm -hmm. no, I went back over here on purpose. So do you see how there's nothing inside of each of these corners? So just, those are understood square roots. Um, and then the value underneath the radical, the A that I've drawn here, is called the radicand. And then the symbol itself is our radical. So those are the three pieces um, involved in radical notation. And I'm actually going to write down what I had said before, because I'd like for it to show up in your notes to, to show up there instead of just me to say it. Um, N equals 2 when we have the square root of A. So it means that we have two radical A. Any other index we actually have written in there, a three or a four or something like that. And technically, anything can be an index. Any uh, whole number can be one of those indexes, or not whole, but natural number. Um, but we're working with ones that are going to be pretty small. Like we're not going to get a 50th root of something. That's not a thing we're going to do. Okay. All right, so we're going to take a look at some more examples. Um, so we saw, um, hang on, I don't know why that's showing up again. I just think I'm just missing a slide. Okay, well, these are not the next examples. I'll have to fix that later. Sorry about that. All right, the next one that you guys have on number five is uh, it's cube root of 16. Is that right? Okay. All right, so just like with um, the ones that were square roots on the previous slide, we're going to break the 16 down into its factors. So all that's the same. All right, so we're, we're going to break it down. 16 becomes what? 2 and 8 will work or 4 and 4, either way. Um, so if you do 2 and 8, 8 breaks down into 4 and 2. I'm going to do it the other way so I have more space. And the 4 breaks down into 2 and 2. So if you broke it down into 4 and 4 first, that's fine. Regardless, you end up with a bunch of 2s, right? Okay. So we have 1, 2, 3, 4 twos. But what we're looking for is we're looking for a cube root this time, which means I'm not looking for groups of 2. I'm looking for groups of 3. So again, I don't have to write it like this every time, but because my work's a little bit kind of strewn about, I don't know why I'm writing 3s. How about 2s? Since my work's a little bit strewn about, I'm looking for a group of three. So there is a group of three here. Once I have one group of three, 
that number comes out, just like when I had the groups of two. So the two will come out, and the other two that's by itself will stay underneath, and we need to make sure when we do this, we include the index correctly. It's a cube root. Okay? The other one um, written on there that's missing on my page, number six, is the fifth root of 256. 256 is definitely the biggest number we've worked with today. Um, at the very least, you should look at it and say, it's even, I can divide it by two. So even if you weren't sure what to do next, um, you could do that. Does anybody know something larger that it divides by? It divides by four as well, it does. Um, we'll use four. So what is 256 divided by four? 64. Um, so four we've done already is two and two. What about 64? Eight, yeah. Sure, you can do eight and eight. You could do other things too, but eight and eight will work. Um, eight is actually three twos multiplied. So I'm just gonna kind of do that all at once. If you don't wanna do it that way and you wanna break it down into four times two and then break the four down, you certainly can. But eight is two times two times two. So this is just a ridiculous number of twos. Really, that's what it is. And I need groups of five. Why is it five? Because five is my index on this problem. I need groups of five. So I'll find five of them. There's five of them. And I think that leaves these pieces not in a group of five. So there's not a single number left this time. There's multiple numbers that are left out. So the group of five items just like my group of three items, and on my previous screen, my group of two items, they come out one time. So I have a two on the outside, and I have an index of five, like that. And then the pieces that remain, I can multiply back together. So what is two times two times two? Eight. It's eight. So there's an eight now that will be left underneath the radical, because I have a bunch of twos, but not enough to make a group of five of them. Is that all right? All right, so let's talk about what like terms mean in terms of radicals. Um, like terms are two or more terms involving radicals um, if they have the same index and the same radicand. So the index has to match, so I can't do a cube root and a square root. And the number that's underneath the radical in simplified form needs to match as well. So I can do square root of two and square root of two, but I can't do square root of two and square root of three because the radicand would not match. So when you take a look at number seven, in order to actually combine anything, we have to check out if they have the same index. Do they? Yes, what's the index for number seven? Two. Two. And how about radicands? Do the radicands match? They do. What's the radicand? Three. Okay, so because those both match, I'm actually able to subtract these and combine them, and I'm really just subtracting their coefficients. This is almost like having 6x minus 2x, right? The x is the pace that makes them alike. So I just subtract the coefficients. So what is 6 minus 2? 4. So I would have 4 radical 3 or 4 square root 3. So tell me what you see on number eight happening. The radicands are different. The indexes are the same, right? They're both square roots, but the radicands are different. So they may not combine at all, but you also might look and say, yeah, but it's an 18 and a 27, and so maybe I can break it down, and they will be able to. And that's what we would wanna do next. We wanna simplify the radicand piece to see if we can make them match. So 18, how will 18 break down? Three and six. <laughs> three and something, yes. Three and six. Three is prime. How about six? How will it break down? Two times, two times three. And if you take a look at this, I'm looking for groups of what? Two, because my index is two, and there is a group of two threes. So there's a two on the outside already. I'll just bring it down. And it's going to be joined by the three that I circled in the pair of two threes. 
the two that's underneath the radical will stay underneath the radical because it's all by itself. How about 27? How does 27 break down? Three and nine, and how does nine break down? Three and three. And I'm looking for groups of two. So this is a group of two. There's two threes. So the eight, you know, it comes down as well as, as, well as the addition sign, so the eight. The three will come on the outside, and now what is underneath my radical? A three. So are my radicands going to match? They're not, but we are going to clean this up one tiny bit by multiplying the 2, the 3, and the 8, and the 3. So 2 times 3 is 6 square root 2 plus 24 square root 3. So unfortunately, I can't merge them together, but I have simplified the radicands of each of them individually. So that would be your final answer? That would be your final answer, yep. Okay. All right, so... I know that some of these, um, you can factor them in your head. Um, and so for super simple, I can factor in my head things. Like if you had to factor 4 into 2 and 2, that's fine. Most of them are not going to be like that. They're going to be more like this, 18s and 27s, where I need to look for groups of things. Okay, So that's going to happen um, as you're working. Um, we do have a product rule for radicals. So the product rule for radicals um, tells us what happens when I multiply. So we were talking on the previous screen about like terms, addition, and subtraction. If I multiply the square root of A and the square root of B like this, I don't need the radicands to match. It's actually fabulous. I can just multiply the A and the B and put them jointly underneath a radical. Isn't that beautiful? Um, and I'd like to show you why it works. And if you don't care why it works, that's fine. Just take it as face value. That's great. Um, but it actually is based on the other section of material that we're not fond of, homework eight with radicals, or with uh, rational expressions. So um, the a, the square, the square root right here, actually has the ability to be written as a power of 1 half. Um, and so when I do this, I can apply one of my properties of exponents. Like this is the distributed through 1 half. And I can undistribute it through like that. And then I can put it back in that radical form. So it's really just a property of exponents. So we, it looks like it's something different, but it isn't. And again, if you don't care, it doesn't matter. I'm not asking you to do it or anything, but that is where it's coming from. OK, so we're going to apply the product rule um, for radicals now. So I have square root of 3 and I have square root of 5. Um, so what will that become? Square root of 15. Don't forget the square root part, right? That's it. That's simple. Um, if we could factor 15 and pull something out, we would. Uh, we can't. 15 really is just 3 times 5. There's no way to factor it into any groups of 2. So there's no simplifying on that one. Um, 6 is not going to have it. Not 6. 10 is not going to have that happen. Um, if you would like, you're welcome to actually multiply the 6 and the 15 here in a moment. But I don't actually think you're going to want to. So for the moment, I'm going to actually write it out like this. It worked fine on the last one. The numbers were really small to just multiply them out. But if I multiply 6 times 15, then I have to look and see if it factors. Right? Well, if I just leave it as 6 times 15, it's already partially factored. So I've already done part of the work. Or at least I haven't done any extra work. 6 is 2 times 3. And 15 is 3 times 5. And what do you notice? Yeah, there's two threes. So the two threes mean a three is going to come out, and the pieces that are not in pairs, namely the two and the ten, will stay under. What's two times ten? Two times five. <laughs> it's ten. Sorry. It's ten. Yes. Did it in my head already. Okay. So if the number gets large when you're multiplying, it might not necessarily be helpful to do the multiplication. You might want to do factoring of the individual pieces first. Uh, same thing's happening down here. I have 5z times 2z. 5 and 2 clearly are not a pair, but do you see the two z's? Yeah. So those two z's are in a pair, which means that they are going to come out one time, and the 5 and 2 will get left, making a 10 underneath the radical. Okay, how are we doing? 
Doing okay. All right. Number 12. Um, number 12 is a distribution property. We have seen the distribution property before. We saw it back in like 1.5 or something like that um, on a homework section. Um, and the distribution property says that I'm able to distribute across the parentheses. So I don't necessarily need to show have you show me this, but this is telling me I have square root of five times, or sorry, square root of seven times square root of five, and then I have square root of seven times square root of seven. So the first two, seven and five, are already prime numbers. So I don't want to break them down any further. I really can just multiply them together. Seven times five is 35. 35. So the first piece is square root of 35. But what happens when I have the two sevens that show up now? It's just seven, right? If I were to put them both underneath the radical, it'd be a pair of sevens. Or you could even multiply it in your head, right? What's seven times seven? 49, what's the square root of 49? Seven. So there's several ways to sort of think through why that has to be a seven, but it will be just a seven. And I can't combine it with the square root of 35, right? No, because the seven does not have an index and radical that match that of the square root 35. They don't match. So there's nothing I can do to merge them together. They just have to stay separated. All right, number 13 looks the same, except that there's a two on the outside. So I'm going to write it out one more time. Again, you don't have to write these out, but if it's helpful to see them, then by all means do so. Two square root five times square root of 15 plus two square root five times three. So you might be like, well, what, what am I going to do with this two? Well, if there's anything on the outside of the other radical, we'd multiply them, but there isn't. So the two is just going to come down as part of our answer. The reason I'm leaving a space is because I want you to see that while five is prime, 15 is not. So if I put these underneath the radical together, five is five, but 15 factors into five times three, five times three and do you see a pair? Not really. Maybe five and five. Yeah, this five right here and the five down here. Uh, if it helps you to see it, you're welcome to just pull it down so you can see them all in the same sort of level playing field. So there's two fives that will join the two on the outside. One of them will. And then the three will stay. Okay, let's do the other piece. The other piece, what we notice, is that it doesn't have a radical, right? The three is just three. That's fine. It means that the three gets multiplied by the two because they're both outside of radicals. So the three times the two would be my six, and I'd have a square root of five. So down here, I will have 10 square root three, and I'll pull this piece down, plus six square root five. And why can't I join them together somehow? The radicands aren't the same. Yeah, one's a three and one's a five. Okay. There's product rule. So there's also a quotient rule. And the quotient rule is exactly what you would expect it to be. So if you had the square root of A over the square root of B, what do you think you might be able to do based on what we've already done? Nope. Nope. Divide how? What do you think? The exponent rule is actually what's being used here. I'll show it to you again. But we're just going to put it all underneath. That's it. Oh, wow. Yeah. Now look back at the product rule. Isn't that what we did in the product rule? Yep. That's exactly what we did for the product rule. We just put them both underneath the radical together. So, and again, the reason this is happening, because Chase sort of brought up the one-half power, is really because this is the whole thing, A over B. I didn't write it that way, sorry. Each individual one has a power of one-half. And I can pull the one-half power out and write it like that, which puts me back into the skirt of A over B form. So it's, this is another application of the... Um, exponent rules that we've done from before. 
So why does it matter? Well, it matters because sometimes it's easier to simplify. It's easier to simplify if I can put them both underneath the radical. So here's a good example of one, number 14. Um, I actually could simplify square root of 75 if you wanted to. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, we, could, we could do that first. But I can also apply the, pro the quotient rule directly and then simplify afterwards. So that's the route I'm going to go because I have a choice and I want to show you the product or the quotient rule in play. Okay, so 75 and 3. 3 only divides by 3. Does 75 divide by 3? Yes. Yes. Okay, has anybody ever had quarters in their pocket? 25. How, how many quarters make 75 cents? I have no idea why I said Three of them. It's okay. It's all right. They do. They both divide by 3. So if I were to divide them each by 3, the top will be a 1. What's 75 divided by 3? 25. And not only that, but I can actually use the quotient rule and pull it back out. So I can now take square root of 1 and square root of 25. What is the square root of 1? 1. Is the square root of 25? 5. So we used the quotient rule twice, both in putting it all underneath the radical and in pulling it all back out from the radical. Yeah. Okay. This one doesn't look as friendly, but it's not as bad as you might think it is. Um, it's actually a property of fractions that we've seen. Again, we're using it kind of in reverse. Each of the pieces on top are divided by 5, right? That's what it means to merge them on top. They're, they're each individually divided by 5. So what I can actually do is I can actually write each one of them over 5. So what is negative 25 divided by 5? Negative 5. Negative 5. And what can I do with the 15 square root of 3 divided by 5? Yeah. How'd you do it, Simon? Uh, 15 divided by 5. Yeah, 15 just divides by 5, right? 15 divided by 5 is 3. So I have 3, and then I still have the square root of 3. Okay, again, the pieces that are outside the radical work together, simplify and so forth. Anything that's underneath the radical also does the same thing. Okay. The next piece of information might be a least favorite aspect of mathematics, right. rationalizing. Um, so rationalizing means that we do not leave radicals in the denominator, at least radicals that don't simplify. We, we don't leave them there. So if there's a square root of 7 like there is here in the denominator, we can't just leave it there. Um, the problem is writing as square root of that the combining them together with the quotient rule isn't any better. I still have a 7 in the denominator, and the 3 and the 7 don't reduce, right? So neither one of these are simpler, but there are times when having a radical remaining in a denominator is not desirable. So I'm going to show you, and we'll just do it with this square root of 3 and 7 on the next slide, what we can do to have the denominator not have a radical in it. Now, it's not going to look any simpler. It's just going to have a rational number in the denominator. So what we do is when I have a like square root of 7 on this one in the denominator is that I multiply by square root of 7. And we learned back when we talked about fractions is that if I do something to the denominator, it has to be done to the numerator as well. So on the top, I have square root of 3 times square root of 7. I can merge them together with the, quotient, with the product rule, right? So what will I have? Square root of 21. On the bottom... What is square root of 7 times square root of 7? Square root of 49, which is 7. So this process simply makes the denominator a nicer number. It usually makes the numerator worse. <laughs> so is it better? Is it worse? It's, it's just rational now on the bottom. It's not simpler. It's just rational on the denominator. So can I divide the 21 by the 7? No. Why not? One is underneath the radical and one is not. So I can't simplify the 21 and the 7. It's like tempting to, right? They both divide by 7. 
but one's underneath a radical and one is not. All right, let's try another one. This one is 3 and 24. Um, it's worth noting that the 3 and the 24 actually reduce, so we might want to do that first. So they both divide by what? 3, three. yeah. So I, I would simplify before I start rationalizing anything because it'll keep the numbers smaller. So on the top now I have a 1, and on the bottom I have a, an 8. Now there's a couple of ways that you can do this. Um, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm just going to separate my radicals out with the quotient rule like this. Okay? Everybody good so far? Okay, great. Whether I do it now or whether I do it later, 8 is not a nice number to leave underneath a radical. In fact, we've used it already today. It breaks down. So I'm going to do it now. If you wanted to wait till later, it wouldn't hurt anything, but we're going to have to do it somewhere. So let's break down the 8. So what does 8 break down into? 4 and 2 or 2 times 2 times 2? Uh, on top, the square root of 1 is 1. Okay, I'm looking for groups of what? 2. two. There's one group of 2. So that means one of the twos will come out and the other one will stay under. Okay. If I do this at this point, and I've got the two and the square root of two in the denominator, I don't care that there's the two on the outside in the denominator. It's already rational, right? It is. It's a whole number, in fact. It's the square root part that's not. So when I multiply to rationalize the denominator, I only need to multiply by the radical portion that's in the denominator. So on the top, I'm going to get a square root of 2. On the bottom, there's already a 2 on the outside here. And then now I have a square root of 2 and a square root of 2 multiplied. So what happens when I multiply square root of 2 times square root of 2? It's 2. Or you can say it's square root of 4, which becomes 2, if you prefer. So one of these 2's is coming from here. The other 2 is coming from the simplification of the radicals. And of course, 2 times 2 as the denominator is 4. And I can't simplify them because the 2's under the radical and the 4 isn't. Okay, we're, we're getting close to finished. One more topic. Okay. The goal is to not have radicals in the denominator. And when the radical's by itself, or multiplied by something else like here, where it had a two times it, this is how we rationalize. We multiply by that radical. But sometimes, what's in the denominator has addition and subtraction. And if you have addition and subtraction, simply multiplying by the radical itself will not clear out irrational numbers. So we need something called a conjugate. If I have a plus square root b, its conjugate is a minus square root of b. And this happens when you get to algebra um, as well, like the, the algebra with the variables and stuff that we use sometimes too, um, when we learn about something called difference of squares. So if you don't know what I'm talking about, it's fine. The difference of squares is using conjugates as well. Why does it matter? Well, the reason it matters is because if I multiply two the, these two by each other, I'd like to show you what's going to happen. So we're going to multiply them out term by term. So my first terms are going to get multiplied. A times A is A squared. My outer terms are going to get multiplied. This is an a times negative b, so it's negative a square root b. My inside terms are going to get multiplied. That's positive a square root of b. And my last terms get multiplied. I have square root of b times square root of b, which is b. And it's negative because one's positive, one's negative. So you've probably heard this called FOIL. This is first, outer, inner, and last. But what do you notice about the outer and the inner terms? They cancel. They're exactly the same except the sign, right? And it always happens when you multiply conjugates together. 
every single time. So why does that matter? The reason it matters is because if you know you're multiplying conjugates, you can really just multiply the first term times the first term and multiply the last term times the last term. You don't have to do the inner and the outer because they're going to cancel out anyway. So I end up with nothing right here. And my result is then, whoops, a squared at the beginning happens to be minus b at the end. And what you notice is that there are no radicals. And that was the goal, no radicals. So we achieved it. So we should do a couple of examples so you can see it playing out with numbers. Whoops. All right. All right, so my denominator clearly has a radical in it, right? It does. And it has addition and subtraction in it. So it is the type we're talking about. My denominator is 5 plus the square root of 3. What would be the conjugate of 5 plus the square root of 3? Yes. 5 minus the square root of 3. And if I do it to the denominator, I've got to do it to the numerator as well. Um, I want to do the denominator first because, you know, it's the reason we're doing this. Again, the inner and the outer terms are going to cancel, so I really only have to multiply the first terms by each other. So what's 5 times 5? 25. 25. And then the last term is by each other, square root of 3 and negative square root of 3. Well, positive times a negative is a negative. negative. And what is square root of 3 times square root of 3? Square root of 9, which is 3. Look, no radicals on bottom anymore. Okay? But there's still radicals on top. We just moved them, didn't we? We did. We really did just move them. So on the numerator, we need to distribute the 2 through. So I have 2 times 5, which is 10. And I have 2 times negative square root of 3. So it's negative. 2 stays on the outside. 3 stays underneath. What is 25 minus 3? It is 22. We actually have one additional step that doesn't always show up, but it did here. Take a look at the numbers that are all on the outside of every single piece. There's a 2 in every single one of them, right? Yeah. So we are going to divide each of those three numbers by 2. So the 10 divided by 2 would be 5. The 2 divided by 2 would be 1 if you want to write it. So feel free to write the 1 if you wish or simply leave it off. And then the 22 divided by 2 would be 11. Okay? We have the last one. Same thing, right? Radicals on bottom, addition and subtraction. The difference between this problem and the last problem is what? There are two radicals on bottom. Uh, but the reality is it doesn't work any differently. It's exactly the same. doesn't matter if there's two. I still use the conjugate. So the conjugate keeps the pieces the same. So 3 square root of 2 and square root of 5. But what's different? Uh -huh. The sign. It's addition. I do it to the top as well. 3 square root of 2 plus square root of 5. So I need to multiply the first terms together. So 3 square root of 2 times 3 square root of 2. Well, 3 times 3 is 9. And square root of 2 times square root of 2 is 2. Y'all are scaring me. Square root of 2 times square root of 2 is 2. OK, good. All right, that's good. Um, the last two terms multiplied will be negative. One's positive, one's negative. And what's the square root of 5 times the square root of 5? 5. On top, we distribute the 6. Remember, the 6 stays on the outside. Well, in the first one, there's a 3 on the outside already, so it just gets multiplied. 6 times 3 is 18. So I have 18 square root of 2. On the second one, there's nothing on the outside, so it's an understood 1. So I have a... 6, now on the outside, square root of 5. All right, what is 9 times 2? 18. 18. 18 minus 5 is? 13. 13. And 
I don't think that the 13, the 18, and the 6 will divide by anything like our last one did. So take a look. 18, 6, 13, like our last one, they don't divide by anything in common, right? So unlike the last one, we are actually done once we simplify the radicals on the top and the radicals on the bottom. Any questions? All right. We only have a few minutes to start. If you'd like to stay and start, that's great. If you wouldn't head on up, that's fine. This lesson's lengthy, and it's going to take you a little while, okay? So don't wait until the last minute to do it. Why is it six 